Welcome back, lecture 50. Uh, at some point in time today in class, we will start and um, hopefully make good progress on Taylor series. But I understand we have a couple of web assigned questions. Uh, web assigned is not due tonight, due tomorrow night. Before I forget to do this, this is not open yet, but uh, on the 13th, starting April 13th, the class evaluation. Um, things will actually be available. So that'll go for, that'll get all the classes that you're registered for, but, um, and then I know that's going to be on the cable broadcast and eventually on the DVDs for this class, but uh, cable TV students also will be doing evaluations, and then future semesters that are taking this class on DVD through distance ed will also have an opportunity to do evaluation. So it's appropriate to um, to know that and to think about those. But those become active on April 13th. All right, web assign questions. What one was that? Number five. Five. Okay, um, arc tangent is the same as inverse tangent. Uh, let's see what we already know about that. So I think yesterday we did just inverse tangent of x, and we decided that was the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared integrated with respect to x. So that's not anything new. We've seen that. We actually saw that the first time in Calc 1, where we took the derivative of the inverse tangent, and we got that um, rational function. So now we're anti-differentiating that and getting our way back to inverse tangent. Uh, we also came up with a power series for inverse tangent yesterday. And what did that look like? X squared. X to the 2n? Yeah. Now, is that we integrated it? We had to integrate a power series to get to our final answer. So, do we want 2n or 2n plus 1? 2n plus 1. 2n plus 1? Over 2n plus 1? And we were starting at, I don't know, let's see if we can. This particular series that we integrated. is that. So the first term is 1, and the ratio is negative x squared. So that's what we got for that one, right? And then we integrated that. <coughs> well, let's go ahead and write what that was. That was negative 1 to the n x to the 2n. Now, does that start where we need it to start? The first term, we need for the first term to be positive, negative 1 to the 0, so we're OK. x to the 2n, n equals 0. So that seems to be correct. So we integrated that. And that's where we're trying to come up with this, right? So do we still want the negative? We're not going to change the sign, right? Because we integrate anything that's negative is still negative. Anything that's positive is still positive. x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. So that's an inverse tangent. Is that correct? 
uh, we might use this, so let's write it. What, what's it look like? So the first term is positive, and it is x to the 1 over 1, so it's x. And then we've got a negative, x to the 3 over 3. That's what it should look like, right? Integral of 1 is x. Integral of negative x squared is that. x to the fifth over 5 x to the seventh over seven, and so on. So that should be inverse tangent of x. So can we use that to come up with the inverse tangent of x over five? And if so, how can we use that? Negative x squared with negative x over five. Okay, we could. We could go all the way back here. So if this is inverse tangent of x, and we want inverse tangent of x over 5, where there's an x here, we could put in an x over 5. I don't know that that's going to be it entirely. Is that going to work? I mean, it will, but you'll just have to go back through and look at have to put it fives. Right. We've got to, I think we've got to do a little bit of correction here because Change. this is x. The thing that's being squared is x, and this then is the derivative of x. The thing that's being squared here is x over 5. This is not the derivative of x over 5. What is the derivative of x over 5? One fifth. One fifth. So we can put a one fifth in here as long as we do what? Multiply by 5? Does that work? I think that we've kind of mirrored what this statement says for inverse tangent of x. We've now replaced x with x over 5 and dx with derivative of x over 5. Um, what we decided, we actually kind of mentioned this, but then we experienced it firsthand because we tried to use that formula to get the inverse tangent of 2, and it didn't work and we said it was outside the interval of convergence. What is the interval of convergence for this particular function on inverse tangent of x? Negative 1 to 1. Any guesses what the new interval of convergence will be? Negative 1 to 5. Okay, I've heard two answers. I think they both sound kind of valid as initial stabs at it. Negative 5 to 5 or negative, negative 1 fifth to 1 fifth. Uh, let's see where the, let's get to the interval of convergence in a minute. If this is the route we're going to go, I think there's a better route. But if this is a route we're going to go, um, we would have to write out the power series for this, right, and integrate it, and that should be the power series for inverse tangent. Not awful, but could we possibly do this? If this is inverse tangent of x, and we want the inverse tangent of x over 5, could we put an x over 5 everywhere there's an x? Does that sound like something we do with series like this? In fact, let's do it both ways and see what happens. So that might be a power series. And it just says write the power series for and find the interval of convergence. Well, I'll find the radius. The radius of convergence. Yeah. Um, that would be one of the things I would want to try, but since we have it set up the other way, before we leave th this page again, um, there's our radius of the thing that we had to integrate. 
and we decided that the radius had to be less than one because this is technically an infinite geometric series. So negative x squared less than one, so x squared less than one, and that's where our interval comes from, right? Negative one to one comes from that statement right there. Now if we do that replacement in there, then this becomes negative x over five, right? squared is the radius. So if we work with this, so A is the, fir is the numerator, so this is the first term. This is going to be the radius. So the first term is, and I know we're not to the final answer yet, but let's see if we can get to that same final answer. The first term of this series would be 1. The next term would be what? Negative x over 5. X over 5 squared. squared, right? When we had our radius as negative x squared, we just multiplied by negative x squared as we proceed. Now our radius is negative x over 5, the quantity squared, so we want to do that. It's alternating because the ratio is negative, so the next term is positive, and it is what? x over 5 to the fourth, and then x over 5 to the sixth. Now if that is that quantity that I've circled, which I hope it is, then we would want to integrate that. Is that correct? So if we integrated that, then we would get what? X What would we get here if we integrated this? As if math class isn't bad enough, now we have these dental sounds, right? They give us nice recollections of the dentist's office. That's these nice pleasant things going on in this class. Okay, that's x squared over 25. So the integral of that would be we've still got the 25, right? Got a 1 over 25 we're bringing along. And then we've got an x cubed over 3. Does that work? And here we've got x to the fourth over 25 squared, 625. So that would be x to the 5 over 5, right? Let's compare and contrast our solutions. We did that this way. Well, here we've got x cubed over. That's not the same, is it? Okay. Yes. Now, wait a minute. What did we do with our 5? you got to take out that 3 and the extra 3. For the inverse tangent of x over 5, we've got a, a little extra baggage out here, 5. Did I leave that out? That's going to make it That's not going to make it worse. Aren't we can't we just find the radius by taking the absolute value of negative x over 5 squared and getting a yes. of Yes. So we don't really need to do all this. So the question is not what the series is, <laughs> it's the radius of convergence? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. The radius is negative x over 5 squared, so we want that to be less than 1. So we can drop the negative.
and then we're just going to have, I mean, you can probably see what's going to happen as you spread that out algebraically. We'd have to multiply through by 5, right? Shouldn't you square the 5? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Right? We've got x squared. We've got the 5 squared also, so 25. So we'd multiply through the inequality by... 25. There we go. So our first two stabs at it, neither one of them hit, right? Because it was negative x squared between 1 and negative 1. Now we've added a denominator of 5, but it's really being squared, so the denominator is really 25. But that's x squared. Negative 5 to 5. So we're back where we were. It's centered at 0. Well, we kind of knew that because there's no x minus a. So it looks like, now I still am not, I'm going to have to do a little bit more work. We should get the same answer both ways, whether we sub into the existing formula for inverse tangent or we derive it ourselves. We've got uh, what appears to be two different results for inverse tangent of x over 5? Wouldn't the square root of negative 25 be 5i? Well, we, you don't really do that this way. You say x is, we're going to square it. So could it be as low as negative 5 and still be less than 25? You really don't pay attention to that because you're not going to have something squared. Certainly it's greater than negative 25. In fact, it's going to be greater than zero. But when you square it, what could it be at the other end? It could be as low as negative 5, could be as high as 5. So it's not really taking the square root, taking the square root, taking the square root. We're not really technically doing that. Um, Katie? In the second one, it, it's the same as the first one if you Multiply the denominator by 5. Okay. But 5 cubed. Well, is it? Isn't it? I mean, the first one, I, I can see if we divide that by 5, we, we're matching here. This yeah. is really x cubed over 5 cubed, five cubed is which is 125. And then we're dividing that, actually multiplying it by a third. It's yeah, because you divide that by 5, and then you divide it by 3, just like you did in the first one. Yeah. Because 5 cubed divided by 5 is... Okay, it is the yeah, same thing. All right, so if we took... The, so that's all I need to justify now. This one is really one-fifth of that one, right? Right. This thing right here, if what we said is correct, is one-fifth of this one, Right. That should be the case here, too. So that should be one-fifth of this one. So we're off by a factor of 5. We get this out in front. But then how come in the integral you multiplied by 5 on the outside instead of dividing? Like when we made the correction, shouldn't you have to then... Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I, th I think we're I think we're okay. Let's see if this works. Um, so we took the inverse tangent of x, and everywhere in the formula we replaced x with x over five, and we came up with this one. And then we compared that to the one that we kind of developed ourselves. How did we go about developing that ourselves? we went all the way back, forget the integral sign, we went all the way back to the a over 1 minus r format, we developed our own series, then we integrated each term of that series. But, so we really did this. Multiply by one fifth on the like extended 
series or whatever, unless you're multiplying by a fifth on the integral, like on the one above it, and you're multiplying by five. Right, we've got, this is what I think you're saying. So we've got a, a kind of an extra one-fifth here, yeah. and that's the one-fifth that we're kind of not addressing here. That we've got, well, we're off by a factor of five. So it's the five that's there that's not on the other side. So you have to divide by five on both sides. Oh, yeah. Because the five is, you put the five on that side without, you need to take it away from the other side. So you divide each side by five, and then you have one-fifth on the other side. Yeah, but didn't I have to have that five? I couldn't come up with that one-fifth. Yeah, but I, I think he's saying... put it in there and compensated with yeah. the multiplication by five? But now you have to fix the other side. Like the extended series side. Like you have the five out in front of the um, one over one minus negative x over five yeah. squared. Yeah, but you don't have it in front of the other one. So then you need to divide both sides by five to make them equal. Well, that's what made them equal, is putting that one-fifth and the five on the left right. side. That's what made it equal to the right side, so you don't, you don't need to add a five on the right side. So it just doesn't work. No, I mean, we're off by a factor of five. I've just got to justify how all of a sudden we come in here now and divide everything by five, which that's going to make them equal. I know what's going to make them equal. But how, how do we justify that division by five from what we did here? Which one of those answers is right? Mm -hmm. Well, because <laughs> there's two of them. Which one are we trying to make the other one be like? I think that this is the cleanest way of getting there. So we, that we know that one's yeah, right. I think this one's right. Okay, here, here's the five's the in the denominator in the other side, so you need five in the top of the other one, so you would have put one-fifth in front of the integral sign. Because it's in the denominator of the denominator. Okay, Here, here's what I think will do it, and then I'll spend some more time with it, and then we'll revisit it. The way we have stopped here how does that compare with what we really need in order to integrate this thing? Isn't it one-fifth of what we need? Aren't we missing a one-fifth? Is that correct? This one-fifth that we kind of put in here and corrected for. So in a sense, don't we have one-fifth of what we need? That's, to me, that's the thing that's working right now. So this is really not, in a sense, all that we need. It's one-fifth of what we need. So that means this side is also one-fifth of what we need. But you divide it by five, not multiply it by five. Well, right. That's one fifth. Multiply by one fifth. So I need a one fifth here. I can't multiply this side by one fifth without also multiplying the other side by one fifth. I think that's going to justify it, but I need to put some more thought into that. But I think we have the radius of convergence. <laughs> that's true. All right. Cool. And it should be. The simpler substitution should also work here. So we should get x over 5. We should get x over, excuse me, x cubed over 375, I think is right. So I think that's where it is. I'll, I'll, let me put some more thought into that, and we'll start class with that um, tomorrow. We have a fifth of what we need on this side, so we should have a fifth of what we need on this side. Great. Any more questions? Was there another one? Yeah, but I don't know if you want to <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I mean, that, it's, it's a battle sometimes. I mean, I don't necessarily think that every problem needs to be done in, you know, 92 seconds or just scrap it. I mean, sometimes it takes more than that. All right, I got another one for you. Okay. Um, the integral of... Ready? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to listen to it first to before we oh. decided. The integral of x over 1 plus x to the fifth. Yeah. X to the fifth. And you need to find this form of it. k plus the sum of b to the n. b sub n? No, b to the n power. To the n, okay. Yeah. 
e to the n times x to the c n plus d. C n plus d plus d over all that over e to the e n plus f. Not e to the n, just e times n. Capital E, not the Capital E. Yeah. An unknown constant. Yeah. And times n. Yep. Plus f. Down here? Yes. Golly, way <laughs> too many letters. <laughs> Um, well, we're going to integrate a series, so we're going to have a constant. So that's taken care of. Uh, let's take this guy off to the side and put that in the form of a over 1 minus r. So it's already in that form, almost. We've got the 1, which is what we have to have. Does that work? So the first term is x, and the ratio is negative x to the fifth. So what? Negative x to the sixth plus x to the eleventh minus x to the Sixteenth. And we want to integrate that. Well, what is this? Let's figure out what this thing is first. Uh, the first term is x. Let's go ahead and write that down. Normally it's been a 1, so we just kind of delete it. And the ratio is negative x to the fifth. So there's our ratio to the nth power. Let's start in at 0 and let it run to infinity. Does that work? Does that seem to be describing this thing? Do you want to start it at n equals 1? Wait, no. I'm sorry. Is that any? Oh, um, yeah, never mind. We okay? I think is we're okay. It, is it to the 5n plus 1? Well, we eventually want to integrate. We don't, we're not there yet. We're just trying to get a power series, group together some like terms, and then we'll do the integral of this power series. So negative 1 to the n, let's separate that out. So we know it's alternating. Then we're going to have an x to the fifth to the n, which is x to the 5n, right? And then we've got another x over here. So x to the 5n plus 1, does that work for this one? Everybody content with that? And that is not what we want, but that is this part right here. So now if we want to integrate that, It's in here. So we've got x to the 1, and then we've got a negative 1 to the n, and we've also got an x to the 5n. So these two we put together. Right. Yeah. So we want to integrate this thing. And then we can check it because we have the expanded version up here. We know when we integrate this, we better get what? x squared over 2. And when we integrate this, we better get x to the 7th over 7 and x to the 12th over 12 and so on. So we can check what we have here. Not going to change the sign. So I guess b from this format is going to be negative 1, right? b to the n will be negative 1 to the n. Uh, x to the 5n plus 1, add 1 to the exponent, right?
Now let's see if it gives us what we want. So for the, for the n equals 0 term, we better get x squared over 2. Does that work? That works. Yeah. For the n equals 1 term, yeah, we right. better get x to the 7th over 7. I think it's going to work. I think that's what we want. I had all the numbers but the 2, so everything else is free. So that seems to be what we want. Well, there's the cn plus d, so 5n plus 2, en plus f, same thing. And it looks like b is negative 1. And then we integrated, so we've got also a some arbitrary constant. Does that work? All right, let's get started with Taylor series. Uh, a subcategory of Taylor series they're called Maclaurin series. So the larger category so let's start with a power series kind of generic power series. So we're going to have some coefficient. The coefficient is going to change. In fact, that's where this, that's the emphasis of the Taylor series is dealing with these coefficients and the pattern by which they change. So what it looks like expanded, this function that can be written as a power series, is when n is 0, we get c sub 0, x minus a to the 0, so I'm not going to write that down, c sub 1, x minus a to the 1, c sub 2, x minus a squared, I'm going to write several terms because we're going to lose some along the way because we're going to be taking a derivative. So that's kind of where we're starting section 8.7 is these things called power series, what their um, closed form looks like in terms of sigma notation. And we want to more or less isolate how do we decide what um, coefficients affect each term as we move out to the right and what, it, what pattern would actually describe them. <clears throat> so let's take the derivative of this expanded version. Well, the derivative of, well, let me go back a step. We're, we're going to do that. We need to get c sub 0 first before we lose it, because when we take the derivative, we're going to lose it. So on this side, every, if everywhere there's an x, if I replace it with an a, so I'm going to take the, instead of the f of x, I'm going to take the f of a, I should do the same thing on the right side. Everywhere there's an x, I should replace it with an a when we take every x value that's on the right side and replace it with an a, what's going to happen? Every term that's x minus a will now be a minus a, a minus a, all those are going to drop out. Is that correct? So the only term that's going to remain is c sub 0. So we'll just kind of set that aside. We're going to come back to that. So before we take the derivative, if we put a in for x, it just so happens that the f of a is c sub 0. All right, now let's take the derivative. So the derivative of c sub 0, it's a constant, so it's gone. What's the derivative of c sub 1 times x minus a? C sub to C sub 1. What's the derivative of C sub 2 x minus A squared, quantity squared? X times x squared. Does that work? To the 1? 
derivative of c sub 3 x minus a, the quantity cubed. C sub 3 x minus a squared. And one more. 4 c sub 4 cubed. And I'll just do that. So the pattern has been established. Just like we did up here, before we took the derivative, everywhere there was an x, we put in an a. Let's do the same thing here with the derivative. So everywhere there's an x, we're going to replace it with an a. What happens to all the terms that have x minus a in them? They're gone. They're all zero. So f prime of a is c1. We'll frame that. We'll come back to that. We don't, it's kind of hard to see the pattern until you get a couple steps beyond where we are now. So we took the derivative. We got c1 plus 2c2 x minus a to the first. All right, now we're taking the derivative of c1. What's derivative of c1? It's gone. What's derivative of 2c2 two two x minus a? 2c2. What's derivative of 3c3 three three x minus a, the quantity squared? 6c3 x minus a. Okay, 6, so I'm just going to leave that as 2 times the 3 that's already there. x minus a to the first, right? What's derivative of 4c4? x minus a, the quantity cubed? Four times the three. Four times the three. So three times the four that's already there. x minus a squared. squared. And I told you we're going to lose some terms, so we're going to trust that the pattern is the same from this point forward. Now we've got the second derivative of the function. What is the second derivative evaluated at a? Every term that has an x minus a in it on the right side is going to drop out because those are all zero. Let's do one more. Derivative of what we have immediately above this, derivative of 2c2, that's gone. What's derivative of this? 2 times 3c3, is that it? That's the derivative of this term. Derivative of the next term. Okay, so 2 times 3 times 4. And again, we're out of terms. We've been losing terms, but what's the third derivative evaluated at x equals a? Hey, how about that? All right, so let's gather up what we do have. It probably would be good to get one more. Actually, let's get one more. The fourth derivative, so we're going to, this is a constant, we're going to lose that. Derivative of this is that, right? The next term is going to have an x minus a in it. In fact, every other term beyond that is going to have an x minus a in it. So the fourth derivative at a Now let's gather up the things that we have framed <coughs> along the way and see if we can get a pattern. So we have the f of a is c sub 0, the f prime of a is c1, second derivative at a, third derivative at a, and fourth derivative. So you can probably predict the, the pattern. 
factorial was mentioned, so 2 times 3 times 4. We can certainly multiply by 1, and it's not going to change that. We can multiply this by 1, multiply this by 1, and multiply this by 1. So it's not going to change anything to multiply it by 1. <clears throat> if I want to solve this for C sub 4, because we're trying to figure out some pattern for C sub n, what is C4 equal to? Fourth derivative at A divided by? Four factorial. Four factorial. Let's solve it, the one above it for C sub 3. It would be third derivative at A three divided by 3 factorial. So it looks like we have a pattern. Let's just make sure the pattern works all the way back. C2 looks like it ought to be second derivative at A over 2 factorial. That seems to work. C1 should be first derivative at A over 1 factorial. Actually, this one gets a little tricky, but we want the pattern to be the same. So I guess let's just see what the pattern is. When this subscripted letter number for C is 4, don't we want fourth derivative and 4 factorial? When it's 3, we want third derivative and 3 factorial. When it's 2, we want second derivative 2 factorial. When it's 1, you want first derivative 1 factorial. So what should it look like for 0? Zero? 0 factorial. Thankfully, by definition, 0 factorial is 1. So that's going to work. And it'd be the zeroth derivative. I guess it means we haven't taken the derivative. So it does work. The pattern that we're seeing at work all the way back does work in the n equals 0 case. So in general, for all these different coefficients, c, zero, c sub 0, c sub 1, c sub 2, c 11, c sub 187, they should all be the same. They should be, well, somebody tell me what to write down for c sub n. F. The, nth the nth derivative at A n factorial seems to be the pattern. So that's kind of the first step in coming up with what's called a Taylor polynomial. So let's go back to our power series. The power series for f of x. We wrote earlier today and also earlier in this class. As that, and now we know what we can plug in for c sub n in terms of the original function. Might seem like way too much to memorize, but there's some nice values that are in common. So for c sub n, we're going to replace it with the nth derivative at a over n factorial. And then we've still got the x minus a to the n. So here's what makes this kind of complicated looking thing easy to remember, is that whatever is the order of the derivative is the same number for the factorial, and it's the same power to which the binomial is being raised. that work? So might seem like it's a little too much for me to ask today that you would commit that thing to memory, but you're going to use it enough where it's probably going to be the case anyway, and it's not that difficult once you start using it to, to generate that each time you want to use it. So this is a Taylor series. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot to take what is the Taylor series and make it a Maclaurin series. 
the Taylor series is centered. At x equals a, we've seen what that means as far as the interval of convergence, what it means for it to be centered at x equals a. A Maclaurin series is a specific case. It ends up looking quite a bit easier it's easier to use because it, each time the A value is zero, so you have just powers of X as opposed to powers of X minus A. So because its uses are I guess quite a bit different sometimes than just a generic Taylor series. It's different enough to have its own name. All right, real quick example of how we can get a Taylor series or a Maclaurin series. Actually, since this is our first one, Let's do a Maclaurin series. It's a little easier to do. So it's x minus 0 or just x to the n. So we know ahead of time we're going to have some higher order derivatives. Let's just plan ahead. So the original function is e to the x. When n is equal to 1, the first derivative, this is kind of easy. So all the way down the page, all the higher order derivatives are still e to the x. That's going to make this Maclaurin series a much easier series because we have the same derivative all the way down the page. So for n equals 0, it ought to be the 0th derivative, which is the original function, at 0, over 0 factorial x to the 0. What is that? What's the first term of the <coughs> Taylor expansion? It's going to be 1. Well, all the derivatives are the same. So first derivative at 0 would be e to the 0. It's going to be the same. n is 1, so it's 1 factorial. x to the 1, what's the value of that term? One. <coughs> x. n equals 2, the second derivative at 0 over 2 factorial x to the 2, x squared over 2 factorial. This is really x to the 1 over 1 factorial. I guess we want to get technical. This is x to the 0 over 0 factorial. What's the next term if that pattern is going to persist? X to the Why is e raised to the 0? Because we're evaluating the derivatives at x equals 0. So the exponent of e in each case is 0. So e to the x is a Maclaurin series, kind of a power series. And we don't have enough time today, but we'll next class, see if in fact that's going to generate some of the values that we know it should be generating for e to the x. See you tomorrow.